the following program contains scenes and language of a frank and explicit nature. Discretion is advised. My first podcast. This is your first podcast? Yeah. You're kidding me. I'm, I can't, I mean, this is... Well, we're rolling, so I mean, welcome to Rare Form Radio, Peter DeStefano. Oh, cool, cool. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for having me. Of course, of course. How is it possible that this is your first podcast? Well, because I've done interviews and stuff, but not a professional podcast like yours. Well, this is no by no means professional. I want to warn you. <laughs> I mean, it is from what I've seen. Well, thank I was you. really thank you. impressed. So. Thank you. I'm honored that you invited me. Of so. course. Thank it's good you. to have you here. I've wanted to invite you on for a long time, and... Uh, we have a lovely day off in Chicago today, yes. which is one of my favorite cities yeah, in the country. Too. And uh, we're going to record today just a regular episode. And I thought it would be great since we're all sharing the same hotel yeah. to have, have you in here. Oh, that, that's So thank great. you for coming. Um, thank you for having me. Of course, you play guitar and founding member of Porno for Pyros. Yes. And we're currently on the, the farewell tour. Yes. Um, how's it going so far for you? Well, it's going a lot better than I expected, you know, um, musically we're all getting along and the crowds are, are being responsive and, and grateful. And, and so, um, I'm just doing it one day at a time, you know, that's life. Yeah. Yeah. That's life. And so, um, yesterday's gig was a lot of fun and today I'm enjoying this day off in Chicago and, mm -hmm. And hopefully we'll get to do another gig tomorrow. I would hope so. Yeah. Uh, actually, you might have two gigs tomorrow, by the way. Yeah. Um, so yesterday was what, Omaha? Yeah. And I don't know how you feel, but I feel like, because I I, I'm watching you guys. I know you guys are performing every night, and you have a different feeling than I do. But I've been watching every night, and I f truly feel like every night is getting better and better, which is oh. how it's supposed to go. Yeah. Um, That's too kind. Have you, had a, have you had a favorite show of the tour so far? Um. It's weird, but I like them all differently. I, I know the first show, the first show was was uh, was just as good as last night to me. Like they're all, they all have special moments mm -hmm. where they're great for certain aspects, you know. Um, but as, as a whole, um, you know, the more gigs we do, the, the the more I take chances, you know, and so that's fun. You know, I, like last I night I played slide with Perry's wine bottle. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yes, you did. Yes, you did. Was that your first wine bottle slide? Yes, yes. Well, I just congratulations. Worked, I, I just watched. Well. It. I was like, okay, I'm bored. What am I going to do next? <laughs> I also noticed you've been going into the crowd more the last few shows. Yeah. I know I shouldn't be doing that at 58 years old. Why not? You surf? Yeah. You know, uh, I feel like you're a pretty active guy. Well, because I'm on my back. Uh -huh. It's not crowd surfing with your stomach. True. It's crowd surfing backwards. Mm -hmm. So you don't know what. It's sort of like you have faith, you know. And what was scary about last night was that when I did it at Belly Up or at the Belasco, the crowds are right to the front. So you could just, you know, when they throw you back up, they throw you on stage. Right. Where this had like the stage had, you had to jump down on the subwoofer and then jump onto the barrier holder, the little yeah. foot part where the bouncers jump up to try to hold people down. So I was on that thing and then they lift, they grabbed me and I wasn't planning on it, but I guess they've been watching some stuff. So they grabbed me and turned me around and then got me backwards and I was like, oh great. Now how am I going to get back over? They're going to throw me over and I'm going to- You figured it out. Well, the, there was, there was this guy who really grabbed me nicely and placed me down on the little foot extension thing on the barrier. And so I gave him a kiss like, thank you <laughs> for taking care of this old man. And then, you know, and then I jumped over and then, then it was too, like I couldn't get back over. So I had to finish the song on my butt, uh -huh. you know, on the side of the stage. And when the song was over, I hobbled up and got up there. But I've been lucky so far. So far. Yeah. Um, uh, I feel like you guys have a fan base that is literally supportive of you guys. They, they support oh. you physically when you're going in the, in the crowd. And they've been so receptive to seeing you guys back. And it's been a beautiful thing to see. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I'm so grateful and blown away, really, you did, know. Did you think, so, porno started 93? Actually, in 91, Okay. Perry and I went on a surf trip, and Perry said, you know, I want to, let's, let's jam, you know. 
Um, and so we, we uh, jammed and, um, and it was fun. And then after the first Lollapalooza, we, we jumped right into it. Okay. So. And then uh, did you ever think that you guys would do a tour like this again over these last 30 years? Since oh, it, no. Did it feel like it was just gone? Well, I just like in uh, like 26 and a half years ago, my, um, I was dying of testicular cancer, chemotherapy, bald, and I had a really bad heroin habit. And I just, that was it. Like I needed to commit to trying to save my life. So I thought, you know, that was it. And then when, when I was able to get it together because of some weird hocus pocus out of body white light experience. Which I do want to talk about it if you okay. don't mind. No, no, I'll let's, talk let's, about anything. We'll come yeah. back to that. Cause that's well, when this hocus story. pocus, whether it was real or not thing happened to me, I, uh, I went on a different path and, um, I did music for media as a living, you know, and, and what, what, some explain stuff. to our listeners what that means. It means, uh, doing music for television, movies, and video games. Composing. Yeah. You're composing. composing yeah. or sessions. Okay. Where a composer will hire you and you'll come in and you'll play with the melody that they want, or you'll do some kind of improvisation for them. Mm -hmm. And how did you get into that? How, who, who got um, you in that door? Well, when, uh, when I said I can't, I think they wanted to do, at the time, uh, the manager of the band was Roger, and he was like, I'm thinking of putting, you know, Dave Navarro, Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, you, and we're going to do Porno and Janes together. We're going to do a whole collaboration. And I was like, the idea is incredible, but I'm, I'm a junkie, and I, I got to get save my life, and I'm dying, and you know what I mean? And so... Um, that's when Jane's Addiction got back together and they did the, I think it was called the Relapse Tour. That was what, 97 or something like yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, um, and then I, uh, and then from there, um, I went to someone we were working with named David Turin. Um, Porno for Pirates was, was, you should go to Hans Zimmer's place on 11th and Montana and, and bring your guitar synthesizer and tell them you want to work. Which is one of the biggest comp film film composers of all time. Yeah, so I, and I didn't know him, but I, I someone told me where his media ventures were. So I knocked on the door and I had my guitar synthesizer. And, and a guy named Harry Gregson Williams opened. <laughs> hi, Peter's here. Says, yeah. Hello. Peter no, for no, Hans. No, I said, hi. Peter I'm, for Hans. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I said, hi, I'm, I'm, uh, I just got sober and I need to make money. And, and I'm yeah. <laughs> Uh, is, can I, is there a job for me? And so, um, Harry opened the door, Harry Gregson Williams and his wife at the time, Karen was a big is fan. Is his daughter, Natasha, the actress? No. Okay. Okay. No, okay. this is uh, Harry Gregson Williams, the okay. film composer. I'm thinking of Gregson Widener. Sorry. No, it's okay. Yeah. And so he, so he answered the door and then we hit it off and, uh, I ended up making an album with him called Rambient. And we had Peter Murphy on vocals um, Flea on bass. It was a great album. And then I did sessions for him for the last um, 26 years. Wow. And uh, that's how that started. That's incredible. Um, did you find yourself, when you started working for other people's visions, did it, that must have improved your guitar playing. How did that improve your guitar playing? Well, because um, it, when you compose your own thing, it's your own thing. And, and so it's a little easier to, to do, you know, because it came from you. But one is their idea, and you're not a properly trained musician that, that reads notes off paper and stuff like that. I know chords, mm -hmm. and so, but to peel melodies off of little notes, um, I can't do that. And I did in high school, but I'm not... Uh, I would have to relearn it and stuff. So I was more like ear. I did everything by ear. So it, it developed my ear really strong. Dave and I were just talking the other day about how the talent of playing stuff by ear is such an amazing thing. I can't do that at all. Oh, wow. It's yeah. like some people can just hear something and you just know how, to, how it goes. Yeah, I just I had to develop that in order to, to get paid. You right. Know? <laughs> right. You know, but, but Harry was very, uh, he's a doctor. He's an actual doctor. 
He's got a doctrine of music. He is the complete opposite. Like I got into music from the street, you know, like um, smoking weed and listening to Jimi Hendrix, you know, and Led Zeppelin and going to parties and stuff. He was schooled and got degrees and stuff like that. And he's now a doctor wow. of music. So we're, we're two different things. And where the, the appreciation that Harry Gregson Williams has for me is he calls it fishing which is improvisation, the Jerry Garcia thing, making it up on the spot. And that's what Porno for Pyros has been doing every night. We're yes. doing improvisation. Mm -hmm. And I'm really pushing hard on that with porno. And I think that that's, the people are, are they appreciate that. Absolutely. Because you know? it's a different show every night. Mm -hmm. Not one song is going to be exactly the same. There are a couple of solos where I'll do exactly the same. Mm hmm I'm like, gag me with a spoon while I'm doing it. But I do it just, just, to, just to do it, just to show people. I'm not, I'm not totally crazy. Like, yeah. I, I can do what we composed. Right, right, right. But I'm so bored, you know? <laughs> so I have to, like, try to invent on the spot. Of course, you know? of course. I've noticed that, like, um, uh, with a song like Pets, um, people that are seeing the band live right now, you guys are doing this very long, extended ending of Pets, which is... In my opinion, it's easily my favorite part of the set. Oh, cool. Because it's you just like laying down the smoothest, most emotive parts that are just coming out of you in the moment. And yeah. it, it feels it feels new and it feels exciting every night. Yeah, thanks. And you feel like, it, it seems like you're in a different place. Yeah. In a good way. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it's been fun to watch. Cool. It's that been fun to watch. Um, what was the first band that you were in? Um, my first band was with Eric Avery from I didn't Jane's know that. Addiction. Yeah. Yeah. And we were called Misty Faith, M I S T Y, and then the word faith, yep. like God faith. Uh -huh. And the reason I named it that was because Eric Avery was a, a staunch atheist and I was a staunch, like, Catholic, you know? Mm -hmm. So he, he was the Misty and I was the faith. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. We were kids. We how, were in high school. How old school. were you guys? Um, <clears throat> I think 11th grade, so maybe 16. Okay. Or younger. Was he maybe. playing bass then? He was playing bass. Okay. He was playing bass. And I remember we played bass and there was a mojo that came off him. And we played Sympathy for the Devil uh -huh. and Simple Man from Leonard Skinner. And uh, I cannot maybe, imagine today seeing maybe Eric jumping. Avery play uh, Skinner. Yeah, I know. We played Simple Man. <laughs> Mama told me when I was young. Set beside me, my only son, like those songs, you know, and Simple Man. And um, I think it was for sure Sympathy for the Devil. And we and we played in a guy named Sean Sullivan's garage in Santa Monica, north of Montana, on 12th Street, 12th and Elta. And um, we, we were just a garage band. We never played out. We just played in his garage. Never did a gig. Never did a gig out. Do you guys ever record anything? No, we just went in. There, we, there was nothing to record with. Right. It was, and, and so we uh, we went into because it was tape machines and we didn't have. Oh sure. You was had there, to have a record deal. To was there even tape. like Tascam four tracks and stuff then, or was that not even kind of a little bit before that? Okay, well I'm okay. I'm 58 now, mm -hmm. and I was 16 then or 15. Okay. So what so, year would that be? Uh, Throb. <laughs> what year? I mean, uh, Listen, we had a lot of edibles 19, last night. Okay, We're in a tough yeah. time with math. <laughs> okay, so nineteen eighty, nineteen seventy nine. So they weren't. It wasn't very accessible to have portable recording devices. No, no, you had to have money. So there's no record of Misty Faith anywhere. No, no, and we never played out a party. Mm -hmm. Not even a party. We did garage jams at Sean Sullivan's house, and he was a drummer. And we would have we would invite girls over from. It's we a good did start. it just to get a good girls start. and, and yeah. to bring them over there, and we'd have beers, we get quartz. Eric and I used to ditch school and we would uh, go pimp beers um, and we would get quartz of old English 800 and we would lay on our back and we'd <laughs> gag and like to try to get it down our backs as fast as possible in our stomachs. Then we, we would ditch, I remember we used to ditch, um, I think it was third period and we'd go get the beers in the morning and drink and then we'd come back for fourth period which was right before lunch, and we'd play volleyball hammered, you know, <laughs> and, and our and it was that we we would do it every. It, it was 
was fun. And, and we, you know, Eric, so Eric and I were friends from Santa Monica first. Okay. Okay. And then I met Perry later on the surf trip. So, but anyway, um, yeah, that was my first band, Misty Faith with Eric, but then we never played live and then he moved. And then one day he showed up and he had these monster creepers. Yeah. And he was into a band called Echo and the Bunny Man. He goes, I've been into new music now. I've changed Echo and the I was like, oh, he's heavy. He's like into like new wave, you know? Cause I was like, you know, anti new wave anti, you know, I was like Leonard Skinner, of course, Rolling Stones, Jack Daniels, you know, tough, not like new wave music. You right. Know? And he went into new wave. And that know? must've been where he started learning his kind of bass style. Right. I assume. I don't know because he disappeared and I think he left high school that high school. I don't know exactly. I can't remember. We were all partying and drinking. And then next thing I know, he's on the cover of LA Weekly with Jane's Addiction. And there you go. And, the, and he had like this Bugs Bunny sweater on. Yep. Yep. And this guy with dread. And I was like, oh my God, what are, he's, I'm so jealous. He's so original. He's in something so original. And I'm like stuck trying to be, you know, the outlaws or something, you know, like some, some Southern rock band, you know, you just touched on something. You, you use the word jealousy, which is something I was just thinking of, uh, growing up in LA, you must've had so many friends in bands that found success, right? Was it difficult? I mean, it, for you, is it, it was is just it, Eric. That was all. Oh, that was it. Okay. That was it. It was Eric. And then my friend, James Baker, he's the guitar player in war now. Okay. So it's James Baker, Eric Avery. And then Mike Clark in Suicidal Tendencies, but he was the South Side Santa Monica. Okay. Eric was North Side Santa Monica, and James is North Side. So there's only two people. There's James Baker, the guitar player for War today, okay. and Eric Avery, the bass player for James Addiction today. I didn't know that there was a North and South Side of Santa Monica yeah, situation. Yeah, and then the South Side Turf. of Santa Monica was Suicidal Tendencies okay. guys. All right. And Mike Clark, who I knew as a surfer, but we didn't hate because he was so far, not, not that far now, but right. as a kid, we didn't have cars. You know, it's the schools that we went to. And uh, so he got in suicidal tendencies. Okay. And the, are they are they back together now? They're about to well, go on tour, suicidal, right? Well, there's, suicidal, there's ex-members of suicidal that do lewicidal with okay. an L. Okay. And that's Luigi from Venice and Mike Clark from Southside Santa Monica. Okay. And they're doing Luigi now. And then suicidal is like it's the band leader was Mike, Mike, uh, Mike. What's his name? The, I forget. Oh I my god! Yeah. I'm sorry, but uh, he's on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but Mike Muir, Mike Muir, and his okay. brother Jim Muir does uh, um, Dogtown Skates. Okay, yeah. But Mike Muir is the band leader of that, and so he's always uh, been changing members. It must have been great growing up in Santa Monica in, those, in that time. It was fun. It was fun. But Suicidal Tendencies was a scary band. The people that followed them. Sure. There was, there was a gang called the Beer Nuts. The Beer Nuts? Yeah, like okay. the Beer Nuts. And they would come on the north side looking for trouble. Oh. And they would have suicidal hats. The, the top or the yeah, high brim. ST, and yep. they would be looking for people to beat up. And, I've never understood that. I don't yeah. get that mentality. Yeah. I don't understand that. Yeah. Um, but funny enough, <laughs> speaking of fights, you guys have had... <laughs> We're, we are seven shows into the tour, and there's been fist fights in three of the shows so far, and Where? it is beyond me. Like I've I've been with James Addiction for 17 years. I I, I was with Marilyn Manson for four years, and I never I never never saw this many fights. I don't get it. With like, there's nothing violent about Porno for Pyros, but it's been strange seeing weird stuff in the crowd. And you had a moment the other night where you're trying to calm people down. Yeah, I. Uh... Strange. I, I was screaming, forgive, forgive, forgive. And then I got so mad. And then I said, fuck it. I'm not playing anymore into the mic. I apologize to Perry after, but it's like, I don't want to watch. I don't want to be responsible to, to, to drive people to, to destroy themselves. Yeah. I don't want to cause war, but there's, there's definitely, you know, an influence that, that happens the whole night. It could even be the girls on the stage, you know, like, oh, I'm, you know, they're so hot. I'm going to beat this guy up. You know, we just yep. don't know what's going through their mind. You know, the, 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 the male masculine brain is a dangerous place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it could be, you know, I, I just don't know, but, um, but, uh, you know, I'm, I hope that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Because the, like I said, there's this, the, the overall message of the band really is like, 
love and peace and especially with some of the new songs that they're like agua is all about you know i mean tell people what agua's about well um well surfing surfing that's how i met perry yeah my my the band that i did when eric did jane's misty faith we did that in the garage he went and did jane's addiction i did a thing called k38 which was a surf band which was original we used to wear jimmy z's clothes you know when everyone was doing sort of the Hollywood leather pants, you know, like Guns mm-hmm. and Roses look and everything. I went for the surf look. And the sunset so, strip look was not your thing. You went beach. Well, I just wanted to be different. I've yeah. always wanted to be different. So I went for the beach thing, like like this kind of shirt, you know what I mean? And we we did songs like Hawaii Five-O, Wipeout, Dick Dale songs. And then I started to write songs. And I was singing and playing guitar in that band. And so we had a trumpet and keyboards and drums and bass and me on guitar and singing. <laughs> And, and so we did K30, so it was a surfing thing. So I always wanted to write surf songs, you know? And uh, Perry, his voice is so unique. He's one of one. So I was like, it'd be great to write surf music with, with this voice, mm-hmm. you know? So that's all it is. It's a surf, it's a surf song with, with Perry writing the lyrics and singing. And, uh, and it was written on a surf trip. And he incorporates love, like it's a love story, but with the ocean. Yep. You know. And he's been talking every show about being nicer to the planet and people doing their part, which is a very important thing to, I think, everyone out here. Yeah. You know? Well, Perry, and I've talked about that. Um, you know, th- I was asked, I, I don't remember when or why at this very moment, but about Perry's legacy. What, what do you want to see? For Perry's legacy and the obvious stuff of you know Jane's Addiction is nominated in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame as in the ad for it it says as the band that brought alternative music to the mainstream and the band that helped create the modern day festivals right you know which is like eclectic yep. you know mixing uh, genres together you get sure. hip hop with rock with with you know jazz or whatever and so um that's the obvious stuff but but for me what i what i my hope is at least with porno for pyros is that the music that perry would use his um compositional skills and his unique voice to help the planet and to help people to treat each other better and so that's the mission statement so I try and help to remind Perry that that's why I, we're doing this. Right. Let's, and so when we see a fight breaking out and people, somebody smashing someone's face in, that that's against what we're trying to do. That's not, we're not trying to start a mosh, you know, destroy people. We're trying to treat people to, to, to and it's backfiring. Like, why is it backfiring? What? And then I start It's not think, you guys. I this feel like a- it's my fault sometimes. What? Because I'm like, no, like no, no. Playing with too much energy, maybe I need to like sit down on a chair or something. Or don't think I don't, that. For I get second. scared, you know. You, that's what I want. What do you do. got? Uh, it's definitely not you guys. <laughs> okay, <laughs> it'll it'll happen sometimes. Like as you guys are walking on stage, I've seen fights start, or like you'll play orgasm. Like that is not a fight song. No, <laughs> it's not no. aggressive. Yeah, that was that was beautiful f- and I don't think it has anything to do with you guys. <laughs> then maybe maybe because I'm a. a Misty Faith. I'm a, a, a spiritual person, like mm-hmm. a, a weirdo, you know mm-hmm. I mean? Mm-hmm. And so I'm thinking there's a denying force. There's, 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 whenever you try to do something, whether not at, I'm not at all saying we're even anywhere or I'm not anywhere near like a Martin Luther King, but whenever you try to do something good or peaceful, there's a denying force. There's something that comes and it's like a force in the universe. This is what I believe. And Eric Avery, sorry to talk about Eric Avery, this whole, Thing, but we, we, he used we, to call it the asshole him. factor. Okay. He believes in an asshole factor. I call it the devil. You know what I mean? It, there, there's a dark force that's a denying force. So when you try to do something good, like heal the planet, um, you know, um, treat each other good. And someone goes like, there's, there's something that goes, no, you know, and, and it's almost like Democrats and Republic. Like there's, a, there's, when you try to go, hey, be Democrat, then Republicans, or if you try to be Republicans, then Democrat, there's always this this other thing 
that that's like no you know so how how to push for what you want but not too hard to where you know you're hung up on a cross and killed you know what i mean like like you're too executed far. you know what i mean <laughs> right. you're so, so the goal is i i want to help but i don't want to get executed right doing it fair and so when they were beating each other up i was like i felt like i i, I personally was pushing too hard for heal the planet and no it, but that gets scared yep. about that i'm not yep. saying at all it's that and i have no proof of it yep but i worry you know you definitely don't i i, I promise you don't cause it because watching you up up there every night you are smiles from the beginning of the show to the end of the show you are completely in it for your bandmates yeah you're completely in it for everyone in the audience mm-hmm. and no one could bring more positivity to this camp than you do. Oh, you're too kind. I Thank mean you. it though. I mean it. Like you, 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 you do exude this, this kindness everywhere you go and every moment you're on stage. So oh. if that inspires someone to fight, I don't, yeah, there's, there's, there's no way. Well, I mean, like when we played the belly up, which is like, you know, one of your rich venues, hippies. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's like rich hippies up yep. there. You know what I mean? And, and Michael Goldberg, who owns the place, he's a dear friend of mine. Mm-hmm. He came running up and he was like, you know, you broke the records and and all the merch ever sold ever and and I was like oh that's great news and he goes and we had our first fight ever <laughs> and and this guy punched six of my employees and we put he's in jail and I was like okay so people bought the merch we broke records for that that's great and they got a but boxing the, match yeah I mean, and, then, and, and then six of his employees got knocked out you know like <laughs> that's so I don't know how to how to. It's yin, yang. it's yin yang. You know yeah. what I mean? It's yin yang. <laughs> you guys are America's new street gang. I yeah. Love it. it's, so, it's dangerous it's, going town to town. You know, the hell's angels. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, but we, I know Perry, that's the legacy that I want. Porno for Pirates, Perry. I want for Perry and I'm pushing is his to you. I want to utilize his un, unique one of one voice and his compositional skills with new music like Agua Little Me and the new one that we have coming out. Do people know about that one yet? No. This will be. This is coming out. I think when the tour is over with already. Oh, okay. Will this song be out by then? I hope that the only thing that's left is artwork. Okay. So I was just like, you know, take off a shirt, take a picture of my abs, and put it on the cover. Like, let's do it. Something yeah, you guys I mean, don't like, know. Like, I'm just kidding. Peter has 12 abs. <laughs> no, and I'm just he's kidding. shredded this guy. No, no, no. But anything, I'm like, let's just do something, you know. So then Perry showed Stephen and I what. Um, some artwork that that was done but it wasn't done by perry and, and we were like no it's got to be perry you yep. know yeah so perry's uh got to come up with it and you know we're on perry's time so if it if it's next year or 10 years from now the song <laughs> would say after we're gone it's long gone it comes out but i'm excited about the next song mm-hmm. really excited because it's the most um harmonically um advanced for me i like voicings mm-hmm. like i'm really into alan holdsworth the late great Alan Holdsworth chords, you know, I like Porno for Pyros had um, chords yep. like every like Curse Mail. It's all sevens, nines, thirteen. Like they're chords, you know, mm-hmm. like instead of bar chords. And so, um, yeah, when I fell and ripped my pants, I was doing that song, <laughs> so I had to still do the chords. That's why I ripped the pants because I, I was like, I needed my hand every second, right, you know? right, right. And so I, I, I did this roll, tuck and roll, whatever thing, and ripped it. Because I was trying to like do the slam dancing thing, you know, the overhand when I was playing the guitar. Uh-huh. And I keep forgetting that my mind feels like I'm 15, but my body's 58, you know? Keep and so the legs, yeah. the legs don't fall. <laughs> they don't fall catch up. up. And, I went, <laughs> <laughs> and it's hilarious because I'm not hurt. And yeah. I've fallen, you know, I've done so many things that I should be hurt for. So thank you, you know, that <laughs> I can still walk. <laughs> um, we, have, uh, we have Mike Watt out on this tour. Yeah. Um, the legend, yeah, Mike Watt. Yeah, um, I want to ask you two questions. Uh, one, have you ever met someone like him in your life? And two, what is the difference for you playing with Watt and Martine? But- okay, the first question. Um, well, I've never met a person who believes. Okay, I'm going to sit up with this with with love because it's. I've never met someone who's who's been so dedicated to me as a musician. And that, it, money, you can't buy that. You can give me a hundred million dollars. So my eyes are red right now. They're puffy. My neck hurts a little bit. He calls me every morning at 5.45 a.m. 
the day my mother died, Christmas, New Year's, my birthday, doesn't matter. And the day before my mother died, when I was bedside with her, he does the call and he knows what's happening. He hears her last breaths and his mission is we've got to keep keeping on, meaning progressing. So he, wherever we're at, whether we're on the tour bus, whatever, he gets me up. If I go to sleep at 4.30, I'm up in an hour and a half, in 15 minutes, 5.45, whatever that is. And, and he sits there and reads about John Coltrane, Miles Davis, talks about the jazz greats improvisation. And what he's doing is he believes that... Um, that, and again, this is his words. There was Charlie Christian, there was Wes Montgomery, there was, you know, this is, and now there's Peter DiStefano. And he wants to legitimize me with his properly trained and schooled jazz musicians that he's friends with. So he had, so Mike Baguetta, who wins awards for the best jazz guitar player, Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay, thanks. For the best guitar player, he came up and pl to Camarillo and we went to the mental ward where um, Charlie Parker was in for six months. And we sat on the grass and he played like the hardest jazz stuff possibly just for two hours straight. And and I just played like butter over it all. Like, da -da -da -da, you know? And, um, and then he left. We hugged and stuff like that. And then people were putting me down for what I was doing. So then giant steps is if anybody Googles giant steps, it's the hardest like jazz thing that John Coltrane made. It's, it's, it's um, 26 chord changes in 13 seconds. And it changes wait, 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 10 wait, wait, keys what? in 10 seconds. Yeah. It's called giant steps. I have it on my Instagram. Um, I did a loop of, of the chord changes we said, uh, you said I'm 20, I'm sorry, 26 chord changes? 26 chord changes. In 13 seconds? Yeah. It goes, ja, no, 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 ja, no, ja, no, 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 ja, no, no, ja, no, no, ja, no. Then the cycle starts again. And those are all chord changes. And so I did that loop and then I just did, a, you know, on my laptop, just looped that and, and then jammed to it completely like without one wrong note but really creatively like with whammy bar and all this stuff and the wah wah and all that stuff and then i put it on a thing called punk jazz on my thing because people were 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 um talking shit about me like he doesn't deserve you know like this whole jazz thing so when i did that i sent it to Watt. yep and then i posted it and now everybody leaves me alone good because I, I can do it Fuck you know yeah. i can do i can do but it's all by ear it's not you know like oh f major it's all just knowing that there's only 12 notes you know that's true so, but it, the, the, the possibilities are virtually yeah yeah, yeah. so it, so anyway i guess i have a talent for that yeah but perkins is constantly <laughs> reminding me stop with that bro he goes you're you wrote bali eyes you wrote you know what i mean you're a songwriter you wrote pets you know you're 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 that's these jazz guys don't have that and i was i was like i know but why can't I do both? You know what I mean? So now I'm trying to do it over porno music. You know what I mean? Right. On those solos. Like I'm just totally d doing alien scales. I want you to know that there, there's been conversations amongst our crew, in, in, including with uh, our front of house guy, uh, Stuart. And we compliment your playing all the time. Oh, that's like, too hard. Sincerely, all I do for a living is listen to guitar players. That's what yeah, I, yeah, that's what that's I do strange. for a living. Yeah. And, you are, without a doubt, one of the most consistent and um, interesting guitar players I've ever seen. Oh, that's... I mean, so consistent. That's uh, so kind. I, I feel yeah. like you don't really hit wrong notes. You don't break strings. You are consistently playing the parts solid in the pocket. It's very, very impressive. Oh, that means the world yeah. to me, Dan, especially coming from you. God. But also, like, I never see you not with your guitar, so it makes sense that <laughs> yeah, it's, well, it's I a part of you. Well, because Mike Watts, so the whole the question, yes. it's a two-part question. Yep. Yep. It's Mike Watts' fault. All I wanted to do was play Sweet Home Alabama and make out with chicks. That's all I wanted to do in my life. It's a great I didn't want to get better. You know what I mean? <laughs> all I wanted to know was about, I wanted to learn about whiskey and women. That's it. The whiskey turned on me. Yeah. And then the women starts, I love women, but it's getting bored. You know, yeah, boring. Right. And have so why? guys? No. no I, I, uh, 
accidentally. That's why I'm sober. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I'm going to hear that story too. But okay. Oh my gosh, it's hilarious. Okay, we'll save that. Okay. And then uh, the second question was the difference between playing with Mike Watt and Martin Lenoble okay, okay. as a player. So Mike Watt, is why he's so unique is he's the love that he gives me, the, the push. He makes me practice every morning, seven days a week, 5.45 a.m. until 7. We're just, he's, he's like a... Uh, like uh, a crazy teacher, you know, like a driving a, force, a stalking yeah. teacher that like, just won't stop. And I'm so grateful for that, that even in my mother's death, even on Christmas morning, I'm taking the call and people are like, why don't you get a restraining order? Like the guy's crazy. <laughs> I'm like, because you could, I couldn't give him enough money for what I'm getting back in return. It's a beautiful so, thing. He's a beautiful thing. Yep. It's that. And then second, the difference, they're both really clever. Martine to me, is like, he's like a cross between Eric Avery, Flea, and Mike Watt. Oh, interesting. He's all three. Yep. And so um, that's why I love Martin. And Martin, we love each other. We're so, we got to do three songs with him and we got to do shows in 2022. Mm -hmm. So I'm grateful we got to do that. Yep. We did that later. And we did a lot of healing because we did a lot of... Uh, damage back in the day so of we got course, to all yeah. heal and, and get to this point so yeah i mean you know it's a beautiful thing so that that's martine to me mm -hmm. is he's so all three of them in right one. right i've been uh, really impressed just every night when uh or when when perry does band introductions hearing the eruptive uh, applause that mike watt gets yeah he's just like beloved i mean from the Minutemen to fire hose yeah. to just the the personality that he is yeah it's fun. It's well, I mean, fun. I heard Eric Avery and Flea say that hands down, he's the best. Like what? Like they both said it, and everybody said every bass player says. And to me, he's like this crazy plumber who won't leave me alone. You know, <laughs> and and I mean that's what he was. And then I I was like, who's it to Flea? You know, I was like, who's this guy? Who won't leave me alone. Yeah. Bro, he's the heaviest dude of all time. He's Mike Watt from the Minutemen. And on Red Hot Chili Peppers, the album uh, Blood Sugar Sex Magic, on the back, it's dedicated to Mike Watt. I mean, there Just, you go. That's it. Just one guy. There you this go. album is dedicated to Mike Watt. Yep. When I talked to Anthony Kiedis, he was my biggest influence is the Minutemen. Double nickels on the dime. That's it. That's, they're just, yep. my, they idolize Mike Watt. And Mike Watt to me is like, like we were in. A steam bath today, you know, just me and Watt and Perk. And he he went, Perk and I got came out, we were almost fainting. I was sick. Then Watt went back in. I was going, Watt, are you okay? And he goes, Take your Barbie person, go, you know, like he screams at me and go, and he goes, Go sit in the lobby. You know what I mean? So I had to take my Barbie first because I was so worried because he was walking around and I, I'm worried. I, don't, I love the guy. He's gonna who's he calls me every morning. I need him to live. You know, yeah. outlive me. Yeah, yeah. Because if he goes before me, I, I, it's going to be hard. Right, right, right. I, I, nobody else is pushing. But me. he is a yeller. I mean, I'm, I'm your guitar tech. I'm his bass tech, and he he yells at me every single day about <laughs> something, and it's probably the best part of my day. Yeah, I know. He's he's, um, <laughs> but not yelling at me like he's angry. It's just like a, explaining his likes and dislikes. Yeah, and uh, I love it. I love it. No, I mean, but yeah. So so it's no, but the, the reason people cheers. He is not servicing a lifestyle with music. Mm -hmm. He is the real deal. He, he lives it. Uh, he, he, it's it's uh, the the best influence on me is if I'm getting good, it's because of him. Perry. Love that. Well, thank now, you, Mike Watt. You know, he, yeah, thank you, Mike Watt. Yeah. He is he is the reason. Because, like I said, I would just be sticking to Sweet Home Alabama, Jack Daniels, and Girls. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's, so let's talk for a second. You, you mentioned uh, that. Almost hooking up with a dude got you sober. I definitely want to hear that story. <laughs> well, we were okay. We were in Bali. Me, Perry, Martine, Roger, Steve. I think Stephen was there, and we were on a surf trip in the beginning of Porno for Pyro. I was in Bali, and I took a a, a quaalude and drank the stuff called Iraq. It's like moonshine in Bali. It's okay. called Iraq, and I drank it and. And I was like trying to show off to Perry, like I'm a bad boy. And I was like, hey, let's go get a hooker. You know what I mean? And, and there was these lady men, lady boys dressed up like girls. Yeah. He, Dave loves Lowe's. And, and, so, and so I thought it was a girl. Mm. So I paid this guy 50 rupees to give me a blowjob. And they were all listening and laughing really hard. <laughs> 
And and I didn't know it was a dude, you know. They did? They all did because they oh, could that, tell. And I that's couldn't. what friends are for. That's right what there. friends are for. <laughs> so they didn't tell me. And Martine was crying, just crying. You know, they were just totally laughing. Oh my God. And, and I was like, and then I came out of the room and I was like, that's the best blowjob I ever had. You know? Because <laughs> the guy knew what he likes too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> knew how to do it. And so then they were all laughing and they told me. So I started crying, you know. I was going, I'm gay. I'm gay. <laughs> it felt so good. I'm gay. You know? And so then the next morning. <laughs> I didn't make sure it said, felt so good I'm gay. <laughs> and ah. so the next morning, we were walking in the town and all the little kids were looking at me and pointing and laughing because they knew I got taken by a. a oh, God. You know? And so, um, so that was the, the first time. And then another time we were on a boat. We rented a, a boat and there was Captain Bob and he was driving the boat. He was the captain and we, we lived on the boat. We were surfing in Indonesia in the Mentaus, all these like tropical places. And, and, uh, and uh, I had passed out on the boat. Like I think I took a, a Valium and drank some Padang Padang beers. That'll do it. And then um, I woke up in the morning we're all on the, on the deck partying at night, you know, in the middle of the ocean. And then I passed out and then I woke up in the morning and I was naked on my, on my stomach face down in the captain's quarters. And he had one of those, you know, those round windows and it was open. In yeah. it. You know, a there was a seagull, yeah, yeah. a porthole and there was a seagull sitting on it. And I was sitting there and I was on my stomach naked and had a little square towel on my back, on the bottom of my back. And I was like, Oh my God! Did I just get raped? And so I felt as if I, if I got raped or what, and I couldn't tell anything. And then I got up, and I was like, "Who brought me down? Why was there a little towel?" And he goes, "You were cold, so I wanted to cover you up. Cold with a little towel <laughs> like on the like small a, like a of my back, cloth. like a washcloth on the small of my back, and I was naked." So then the whole everybody was laughing. You got raped by Doctor Bob. And, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so again, so that's when I started to consider. Okay, that's again, two that's times, what friends are for. Two strikes. You right. know what I mean? So I need to like maybe get sober. Right. So that was a big influence. Like I keep ending up waking up with men. You know? Right. <laughs> and I just, and I'm not gay. And so it was like, you know, maybe not I should yet. think You'll about, get there. Yeah, I'll keep yeah. trying. But that first experience, it felt so good. I was crying. That's you know? really, really funny. Confused. I'm sorry that happened to you, but that's very, very funny. <laughs> um, so this, this leads into the, the near death thing that you told me about before. Yeah. And I would love for you to talk to people about that because it was a, that's what got you sober yes, in the end. hundred percent. Can you go into as much detail as you can about okay. that experience? Well, I'm 26 and a half years sober right now. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. And um, I went through eight drug rehabs. So I had a really hard time, you know, getting this thing together. And in my last drug rehab, um, there was a kid. He was, I think, 16 or 17 from Texas. And he had this accident. And he was in there for for heroin, too. And, um, and he said... You know, he, he was talking to me, he goes, I like your band. And I was like, oh, cool. And he goes, I love Blood Rag, the song, the song Blood Rag we have. It's like, oh, cool, cool, yeah. And then he goes, my parents don't like you. And I was like, oh, okay, you know. And he goes, because he had posters of me and his parents thought that I helped influence him to get into drugs, you know. And so then we were sitting down, we were having breakfast together in the rehab. And he put a note to Peter a folded up note and he got up and walked away when we were eating so I opened the note and it was a suicide note and he goes by the time you finish reading this my veins will be open in your bed so he was going to my bed to open his veins in my rehab bed so I got up and I screamed and I went running and the nurses heard me scream so they all chased me I went into the hall and they were all following me the doc you know the psychiatrist it's mental it's a rehab and then I went in there and then uh he had marked with a marker the veins where he marked his veins with the mark and he was ready to do it. And then they grabbed him and they stopped and he was screaming like a demon. He was making this sound going, hey, hey. it was like a demon and they grabbed him and they put him in a straitjacket and they took him away and I never saw him again because he was underage. They probably took him in a mental ward. And I fell to the ground and I said, God, this is the first time I ever like screamed God. I said, God, please stop this. Give me an honorable death. Let me jump in front of a bus and save a baby. I don't want to influence people anymore like this. It's wrong, you know? And then I laid on my bed and the nurses came to give me drugs. I said, no more fucking drugs. I screamed it. 
And then they walked away and then I jerked out of my body and I was looking over at my back and there was this low end sound, the lowest rumble, like a Harley, but going like a rumble, like a motorcycle rumble, but super low. And I was floating on those vibrate on that vibration. And then the next thing I know, I'm jerked into space. Like I'm in space, like out there. Yeah. And, and I see a shutter of light, like it. It's going like this, like a, like a camera yep. lens opening and closing. And I went in and I could perceive 360. Like, you know, you don't see this much of your life. I could perceive all the way around. And it said all at once, a creative intelligence, God, whatever it is, came through 100 alcoholics. They wrote Alcoholics Anonymous. Go do this. Do You know, did, marry the girl that had your kid. Do You know, it all like an instinct. Like there wasn't words. It was like. So I, I got to do, like, I knew what I had to do, you know? Then I was over my body again on that rumble, and then I fell into my body, and I sat up, and I go, I'm fucking freaking out. This is trippy, trippy. Like, what the hell is happening? And I was really scared, and I laid it on my body again, and then it happened again. Then I was in space, and I saw orbs, like, uh, like, like polywogs, but light. We were lights, you know? And we had tails. It had tails. They were conscious. Like, they were like, they, they were felt con- like Consciousness. Were- yeah. And then I saw Perry. I go, Perry, look, do you see the shutter? You know? He said, I don't see it. And then I went back in, and then some more information came in of what I had to do. And and I was told, you know, when you're addicted and you're still in a in a body, if you leave or you die, you're still addicted, your spirit. And so it, it, th- that all came in and then I, and then I was in my body again and then I never jerked out again and then for three days straight I saw ghosts everywhere in the rehab in your waking waking in my well, waking yep. I was walking around I was looking at them and it, they were it was energy it's light it's just light uh, uh, souls souls with the they're electric we're all electric so they were electric like like watery vapors of electric does that make sense I, I know what you mean and they were addicted and they still, they were trying to get into bodies to go get dope, to go smoke a sex addict. They're still in, in, they're burning in hell. They're burning with addiction and they don't have a body to go use it, you know? So they're, they were trying. So the, I was seeing all this and then the people in the rehab said, don't talk about it because they're never going to let you out. It's crazy They'll stuff. Think you're you're crazy. Right. So they go, but you're having an out of body while let experience it. Most people that have that, they stay sober for the rest of their lives. So I was wow. chain smoking two packs of Marlboro Reds a day. I was on every bipolar medication. I was addicted to heroin, crack, everything. It all le- it was gone. The fight was over. That was it. That was it. No more smoking, no more anything. And it was, it's, people are like, I'm so proud of you. And it was a gift. There was nothing. So whether it happened or not doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. I followed it. And I did what they said or what that, all that stuff said to do in an intuition, in an instinct. And now I have 26 and a half years sober and I can be around drugs. I can, you can do lines in front of me. I'll get you lines. You know, like I don't, I have no, uh, there's no fight. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, we, I'm not for it or against it. I'm just like, we know so many people where that struggle is like an, a daily struggle. You're so fortunate. Yeah, it's to, just, so it's, it's a gift. So mm-hmm. there isn't like, you're, you know, you know, just bite the bullet and do it. It was just, it was taken from me. And so, um, so I'm here right now and I'm grateful for that, but, but that's what it was. So I can't tell you it was real. I don't know. You know, my mother died uh, a couple months ago yep. and it's her birthday today, her first oh, birthday as a, as a spirit. But what's her uh, name? Her name was Leela. Leela. Happy DeStefano. birthday, Leela DeStefano. And thank, thank you for your son. You. Thank you. She did Aww. a great job. Yeah. That's she yeah, really so did she, a great job. So, but I was with her when the first tour was postponed and moved on. I would have missed her, uh, the time that I needed to be with her. So thank God it was postponed and we got to do new music. And, uh, but I was with her for the last month of her life, like in the, in the hospice home. And I slept on the chair right next to her. I wouldn't leave. And then they go, you can't stay here. I go call the police. I'm not leaving. I'm going to be, I'm not going to, I'm going to help my mom transition to whatever's next. She's not doing it alone, you know? And so when, when I did that, that was the hard part. But as soon as she was gone, like, um, I, I felt like she's free now. So she's with me right here, right now. And, and science, I'm very, very, very into science. I watch nonstop. 
if I'm not talking to Mike Watt or playing in the band, whatever, I'm on YouTube watching videos on dark energy, yeah. dark matter, yep. and black holes. Yep. And that I'm that's it's this everything's there. It can explain it. And the speed of light is so fast, it's so slow in the in the big picture. But what's it five hundred and fifty six million miles an hour or I, something? I don't it's uh, so slow. Put it this way, to get to the first black hole, it's like a couple of thousand years, yeah. light years away. It's so it's so slow, you yeah. know. So but on Earth, it's really fast. You can go around the Earth seven and a half times in one second. At the speed of light. At the speed of light. Yeah. So my mother can be right here in Chicago and be with my sisters in Palm Springs in California instantly. Because yeah. it's that fast. So she it's almost like being with us at the same time. So that's what I believe. It's you a know, beautiful thing to believe. Because of my out-of-body white light experience. And so um, well, when both my parents died, I was the one that saw them in the coffin and made sure that... Because I felt like um, whether it was real or not, with that out of body white light experience, I'm sober, 26 and a half years, and I'm able to to deal with the death of my parents because I feel like they're with me. Well, it must be so comforting. It's comforting because you, you, in your mind, it's not just lights out. Yeah, and they're gone. It's they're, not like I don't just go continuing like continuing in some ways. She was such a good lady. She was. I say she is a good lady. She is. She, it's her birthday today. Her spit. It, it was her birthday of her shell. You know of her. Right. The vessel, Earth, the, vehicle. the vessel, the vehicle of how how many years that thing was there, and so yeah, I'm gonna, I'll miss the five senses, the visually seeing her, hearing her, touch, you know, the smell of her food she cooked, and that you know, yep. all the five senses. But the sixth sense, which is the spiritual sense, we don't have proof of that, so it's a faith thing, sure, you know. But but science, speed of light does go that fast, mm -hmm. and we are electric. If you touch an ohm meter, it goes up. Sure. Yeah, yeah. We're electric and, and, beings. and you brought some of those thinkings to your uh, to your amplifiers on stage. Yeah, they're named a certain way. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, cra so I'm totally crazy, or it's making sense. But I had these visions of the settings of the dark energy, the dark matter, and the black hole. Yeah. And and I had them in a way, and then you put them in a different way, which I was like, that's cool. We'll have the black hole to the right and the dark energy and the dark matter. And, and, and it just, like, it's also being open-minded so you're not, like, totally crazy because you're just, you know, I'm crazy. I, it, 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 like, I had all these settings and I went in without the amps on and I did them all and I go, this is it. Let's go. And then I- Without it, even hearing it. Without even hearing yeah. it. And that's what it's been the whole tour. Yep. It's just been a volume thing. Which is fine. We're, we're, we're doing only yep. just to get the vocal, you know what I mean? Yep. To get a volume thing going. But not the settings. The settings have been the same. So, yeah, I use dark energy, dark matter, and black holes for my three amp settings. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, has the near death experience um, shown itself in your life in different ways as far as. Well, I uh, don't know if I was near death because I wasn't. Oh, dying. not near death, but the out of body experience. The out of body, out of body experience. Yep. Uh, no, because it, nothing has come close. Like, it, there was nothing. I don't even know if it was real, like it, if I dreamed, because it's 26 and a half years ago. Right. But. But it helps me with the passing of my mother. Does you know, it help so my you? mother's birth, first birthday dead, and she was, you know, and I'm okay because we're here in Chicago, Ma. You know, I have you like. have you feared death in your life? No, I'm re of course, of course, especially surfing. I go, no, mommy, when the big sets are coming and you're drowning, you know. Have you fe ever felt like when you're surfing that this is it? That oh, definitely, the most of any any time <sighs> is surfing. Wow, surfing big big surf, but right now. Um, I'm ready to face my maker. Are you? Yeah, I'm at peace. Okay. Like, I'm, like if it no happens fear. tonight, I, I'm excited to see what's next. Right. You know? No fear. Had a good life, life in this body, you know? I, I don't want to. I would like to have, be a grandfather. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see my kids have kids. You know, I, want, I, I don't want it. Right. But I'm, there isn't like some big dark secrets that are going to come out, you know, like, you know everything. You know, I mean, my biggest secret was getting blowjobs from men, you know, and <laughs> I just, I just, now that's how, you know, what else is there? Right, right. right. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, there's nothing, you know, that can come out that, that, uh, you know, I haven't already said. Right. Oh. Well, 
we're uh, we're on the last the farewell tour of Porno for Pyros. Yeah. Um, do you have anything you want to say to the fans or uh, just any any parting thoughts on this last tour and what the future of the band might be? Well, I did two interviews with Perry, and both of the interviews that we did together, he started crying both times, and then he did an interview. Or no, we did an interview together and he cried. Then he did one on his own and he started crying about uh, it. So um, it's confusing for me, you know what I mean? Um, because we're doing farewell, but it's making Perry cry. So I guess, you know, we have fun. We let, well, so, you, guys, you guys have a very clear connection. Yes, yep. yeah. It's not farewell to our friendship and surfing. And, no, no, no. And that uh, goes on. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, do we think that will there be more shows after this tour, or I we don't have no know? No idea. I have no yeah. idea. I mean, I uh, at the at the end of the day, I really respect and love the Jane's Addiction camp, the 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 business of Jane's Addiction, the all of that, and I, you know, if if that can be done at its most gusto fulfillment of destiny. You know, I don't, yeah. you know what I'm yeah, trying yeah, to say. Of course, I, of course, I, I don't guess I find the right words, but I want it to completely uh, manifest what it's supposed to do without getting in the way. Mm -hmm. And if there's any room for anything in the future, when there's downtime and the guys want to jam, I'm ready. You're ready. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. That's how I look at it. Well, we're all having a blast out here. It's been a pleasure um, working with you and Watt and Perry and Perk still and Robin Hatch on keyboards yeah. who's doing a great job yeah. and Etty who's singing. Yes. It's been fun and uh, yeah. I'm grateful for also making a friendship with you. It's yeah, been I am very, too. very nice. I am too. Thank um, you, and thank you very much for doing this with You're us. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It's been a lot of fun. We should do it again for sure. Anytime. Because I, I, I could do a whole other show with you about science and space. Yes. And uh, spirituality and aliens and all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah, cool, cool. Great. Yeah, I'd be into it. Um, all right. This is Peter DeStefano, Porn for Pyros. Thank you very much. And we will be back next week. Cool. This is Lola, and I'm here to tell the world to stop being such pussies and listen to Rare Form Radio.